Thank you so much for joining the webinar today. Um, today we're going to talk about measles. And so um, we're going to go over some simple biology of the virus. So when you leave here, you'll understand a little bit about the virus that causes measles. We're going to talk about the public health importance of this disease. Um, we are going to discuss transmission and exposure risk, so that way you can be with an understanding of how to properly protect yourself in your um, daily work environment if exposed to any persons with um, infection. So just as a brief overview, measles is one of the most contagious infectious diseases um, that we currently know. Um, so just a quick summary, we're going to talk about this more later, but 9 out of 10 people who are susceptible if they are exposed, they will develop measles um, disease. Measles was declared eliminated in the United States in 2000. Uh, we still see sporadic outbreaks around the country, mainly due to um, unvaccinated um, groups of people and also uh, people traveling in from other countries where measles vaccination is not as prevalent. Measles is a respiratory viral disease, and so we're going to talk about the importance of worker protection and um, the involvement of respiratory protection uh, during this webinar. It is an um, extremely preventable disease by vaccination, and there are many worldwide outbreaks um, every year. So to start with a little history, uh, this disease became uh, notifiable to public health departments in 1912 within the United States. Um, it's been around for a long time. Um, there was not a vaccine available until 1963. There was a slightly, be slightly um, effective vaccination available in the late 50s, but it was a killed vaccine, and so most people had to be revaccinated because it was not very effective. Um, before there was an um, available vaccination, most ch children um, did get measles before the age of 15 because it is so contagious. Um, and it is hard to prevent um, without the vaccination. In the late 80s, there was an outbreak that demonstrated that really two measles vaccine shots needed to be given to children to be more effective and to prevent future um, incidents. So that's why when you get the measles vaccination, there's a second dose that's given a few years after the first dose. And just a little bit of history over the disease, before there was vaccination, um, typically, we saw in the United States three to four million cases a year. Um, of those cases, 400 to 500 people would die. Um, almost 50,000 people would be hospitalized, and almost 1,000 people would develop encephalitis, which is a swelling of the brain or um, meninges, the spinal cord. So it is a pretty serious disease um, if you're susceptible. So this virus is a member of the Morbilliviridae uh, genus in the paramyxovirus family. It's an um, RNA virus with um, a envelope. So it's pretty easy. We're going to talk about disinfectants later, but it's pretty easily um, killed by disinfectants. The unique part of measles that is really interesting is that there's only one serotype, which means that when, you're, when a person is exposed, um, the antigens on the outside of the measles virus trigger the same type of immune response in the body. There are many different genotypes, meaning that the RNA of the virus might be different. There's actually approximately 20 that are um, identified during various outbreaks, but there's only one serotype. So even though they may be genetically slightly different, they still cause the same immuno immunology response in the body. And so um, it makes for a very stable infection and very vaccine um, preventable. In addition to that, humans are the only reservoir of this virus. Humans can transmit measles to non-human primates, for instance, but the incidence in the non-human primate population is very low, and so they don't tend to transmit the disease um, and sort of proliferate the infection within the, um, within the world. The main reservoirs are going to be humans. Um, which is why, again, um, what we're going to talk about later is, is pretty important. This virus is readily inactivated by heat, sunlight, pH, and many different disinfectants. I'll talk specifically about those in a, in a few slides. Um, the virus is stable on surfaces for about two hours, so that's really important in case somebody with measles does come into a clinic area, um, that that area you know, would need to be cleaned. Um, the surface is clean just because you know, for two hours there could be potentially infectious particles. In terms of diagnostics, measles virus can be found in multiple um, body fluids. 
the easiest for culture would be the throat and nasopharynx, but also depending on the um, infection, there might be measles virus in the urine um, and also commonly found in the bloodstream. And so if there was somebody sick, those are typically the cultures that would be taken. In terms of transmission, um, measles virus is highly contagious. So it has a very low infectious dose um, and it's contagious, interestingly, before you get the um, very common rash. I'll show a photo of the rash in um, the next slide. Um, but you're contagious from four days before to four days post rash. And so the initial symptoms are very, you know, sort of common cold symptoms. And so somebody may not realize that they have measles infection and they may be spreading it. And the transmission um, frequency is actually the highest before the rash occurs. Um, this virus lives primarily in the nose and throat. And so if you cough and sneeze, um, then the droplets will be spread. It's spread primarily through um, direct contact, but also through respiratory particles and indirect contact. So it's important if you are, if you think you might have measles infection to, you know, cover your nose, wash hands, and also potentially to wear a mask to prevent droplet um, exposure. So the symptoms typically are a high fever, um, cough, runny nose, red watery eyes, um, but again, these are very sort of common symptoms, which may be initially hard to diagnose. Uh, a few days after the symptoms develop, usually approximately two to four days, um, you may start to see flat um, or white spots in the mouth. And then um, these sort of red spots, as you can see on the slide here, that are indicative of the measles rash that start um, from the head and move downward on the body. Depending on the person, additional complications might be possible. So these are typically found in children under the age of five and adults over the age of 20. Um, typically with infection, they can experience diarrhea and vomiting, which can lead to dehydration, uh, middle ear infections, um, conjunctivitis, uh, laryngitis, and also more serious complications include, include pneumonia, bronchitis, and croup. Um, encephalitis can occur in approximately one out of a thousand um, persons and also the same frequency um, this virus infection can be fatal. There is some um, data showing chronic effects of measles virus in terms of a, um, it's a very low occurrence um, in that there could be a fatal central nervous system disease that develops approximately six to seven years after infection, but it's not very common. So the main um, prevention of measles is vaccination. And so the CDC recommends a two-dose vaccination cycle in the United States. And this is just a schematic showing the coverage of immunization around the world for measles uh, virus. And so the areas in blue have a pretty high um, vaccination rate, but the areas in red have a pretty low vaccination rate. There are some areas in gray or white that's either not applicable or there's no data. But you can see there are areas that um, have pretty low vaccin vaccination rate, but people from those countries, you know, still are traveling to the United States, which is one of the main reasons we still see measles occurring here in our country. So I feel that this slide is pretty um, indicative of, of how this is really important for public health. Um, you know, we hear a lot about the more scary, quote unquote, viruses like Ebola. But one person who's sick from Ebola only really may affect two persons, two to three people. If we look at flu, that increases a little bit. Um, if you're sick, you may um, infect up to four people. But if you look at measles all the way on the far right of the slide, one person with measles virus infection could um, affect 12 to 18 people who are susceptible to this virus. So it is very contagious and people who are not vaccinated are highly at risk. Um, and if they are immunocompromised or in any way or um, highly susceptible, then it could be a much more serious um, infection for them. And so this schematic is just showing the number of um, reported measles cases up till January 2017. And you can see in the United States that we still have, we have a low number of cases. It's less than 100 per year, but this is still pretty significant since it is, um, you know, a pretty serious illness that's highly spread. And so it still requires a, a good public health response in order to contain um, the, the persons who are sick. Around the world, we have um, the areas in red have greater than 1,000 cases. 
And so, you know, people traveling from those countries um, could um, be more of a risk for folks who are um, not vaccinated. And so this slide is really talking about herd immunity. And so the vaccination for measles is part of the MMR triple vaccine. Um, typically, you see one dose given to children right around the age of one, and then a second dose a few years later when they start school. The CDC finds that the vaccination is 97, 97% effective in preventing measles infection. Um, the persons who may still get infected um, typically have maybe a poor immune response to the vaccination. But when we, we, we talk about herd immunity, and this virus only lives in humans, the reservoirs are only humans. So the outbreaks that they see a lot in the United States are due to maybe somebody traveling, but also due to pockets of unvaccinated persons due to religious or um, ethical reasons. And so um, they're within those, um, those clusters, the virus will spread. So on the left-hand side of the slide, you'll see the person in the dot in red showing an infected person. And if you see an, an arrow in red, that's showing transmission of disease. So if you have um, a population that's not well vaccinated, you're gonna have disease transmission and you can affect uh, multiple people very quickly because this virus spreads um, quickly. And again, you may not realize that you're, um, you're sick with something so highly contagious. On the right-hand side, you can see that you have an infected person again, but all of the blue are all of the vaccinated persons. And so you may transmit to one person, but then if you have a lot of people around that person who are vaccinated and immune to infection, then the disease dies out and it can't find another host. And so you are easily able to um, stop that, that spread. So in terms of public health um, and epidemiology, when people are looking at cases of measles infection, they're going to ask people about their immune status um, and we're gonna talk about how they prevent further spread in, case, in the event that somebody is not immune. But it's very important to know um, the population in order to follow up appropriately um, in terms of public health. So in the United States, this, this slide is just um, looking at the, the past outbreak. So there was sort of a, a surge of measles in the 2013, 2014, 15, um, there were several outbreaks, and also this is around the time when there was a lot of discussion about, um, you know, not wanting to vaccinate children because of the fear of, of autism. Um, and around 2015, also, they published that those, some of those findings were not valid. Um, there was a lot of um, cases in California because there was a measles um, case at Disneyland in uh, 2015. So um, that is why California is so dark and shows so many cases because there were a lot of people in Disneyland that were susceptible to that case. So um, right now in 2017, there have been 61 cases. This was as of April 2017. There is a current ongoing outbreak in Minnesota uh, due to a cluster of unvaccinated persons. So it's still prevalent in our country. It's a very low um, number, but it is a um, reportable disease and um, the health department does need to respond and do a lot of follow-up if somebody with measles is found to be in a, a clinic or a certain environment to ensure the prevention of spread. So what do we do if we encounter a measles case? So this happens um, somewhat often in a clinic where somebody is suspected of measles. Um, the first thing to do is really isolate that patient. Um, if possible, a negative pressure room um, or an isolation room but if anything, if you don't have those available, a simple room with the door closed is sufficient until that person can be moved um, to an area where they won't um, potentially infect other people. Uh, one of the other things you can do is put a surgical mask over the person so that way any droplets, if they're coughing and sneezing, um, you know, don't get spread very easily. The other thing that's really important is understanding respiratory etiquette and airborne precautions. So if there is somebody with measles infection in the clinic or a hospital setting, um, it is important that persons in the clinical environment understand the respirator use um, in terms of wearing N95 or N100. I'm gonna speak more about the regulations in terms of respiratory use in a couple of slides, but um, wearing a surgical mask is not sufficient. Um, it's really important to hand wash, not just to use hand sanitizer, but to really wash hands with soap and water, and then to wear, um, you know, other PPE like rear closing gowns and other things to prevent contamination of clothing. 
It's important to put signage on the patient room um, in terms of people who are not immune or immunocompromised or pregnant should not enter that room. Um, measles virus infection can cause um, some complications for unborn children, and so persons who are pregnant should not be exposed to somebody with active measles infection. Uh, the clinic or, or hospital would need to report the sick person to the health department, and the health department would have to follow up and start doing epidemiology to find um, potential contacts of that person to ensure that they're immune um, and don't need any uh, follow-up. It's also important to obtain specimens for testing to ensure that it is indeed a positive sample. And typically, again, these are going to be serum and, and throat swabs, and they would be sent out most likely to the local and state health department. Um, you know what? Sorry. The other thing that is going to happen, and on this slide there's a picture of the vaccination. And so um, most of the time when um, somebody comes down with a measles case, the first thing they're going to do is ask the healthcare workers about their immune status. And so um, the next slide I'm going to talk about the response to measles infection and what is given, but typically the MMR vaccine can be used in a post-exposure situation. So in terms of worker protection in general, um, respirators are very important to prevent respiratory um, transmitted diseases. Many clinicians I find um, do not receive annual training and fit testing according to the OSHA respiratory protection standard. So OSHA has a very detailed law in terms of respiratory protection for employees that need to wear a respirator. Most clinicians in infectious disease units, emergency departments, um, they may have a department within their organization that's going to fit test them and train them annually, but maybe smaller um, doctor's offices may not have all of that available to them. So it's important to understand um, and to perform a risk assessment as whether or not you need to have respiratory protection available, but if you need to wear a respirator, you need to be fit tested for them. An N95 or an N100 respirator would be sufficient to protect against um, measles infection. Um, however, if you're not fit tested for that respirator, it probably will not provide the protection that you need because you may not know that it's fitting you. Additionally, if um, men with beards cannot wear an N95 or an N100 because it would not pr uh, provide a proper seal around the face area, and so wearing a respirator in those cases, um, they would need something that would actually fit over their head or would need to shave. Um, so it becomes a little bit complicated, but if you do think that you may service folks that may have measles and you need to wear a respirator, then understanding the respiratory protection standard is very important. And when we talk about influenza in the next webinar, we'll also talk about respiratory protection. So this is not the only virus that a respirator would be useful in terms of preventing um, infection and exposure. Uh, measles, fortunately, is very susceptible to a lot of different disinfectants. So 1% um, sodium hypochlorite, so basically a dilution um, 1 to 10 of household bleach, um, maybe even less than well, 1 to 10 dilution would be sufficient for surface cleaning. Although it's also um, susceptible to phenolics and paracetic acids and hydrogen peroxide. So there are a lot of different disinfectants that would be suitable in case a clinical area needed to be wiped down after um, a potential um, measles case was present. And always remember when you're using disinfectants to let it sit for a contact time according to the manufacturer. Otherwise, um, if you just wipe it right off, it's not actually going to provide any um, killing to whatever might be on those surfaces. And then finally, in terms of post-exposure. So typically, if somebody has been exposed to someone with measles, the first thing is going to be checking the immunity status. So um, to do this, it's a simple blood draw, and then the serum is monitored for immunity. Uh, the person might be asked when the last time they received the vaccination, um, the MMR vaccine. Um, if the person doesn't know, um, typically they may be offered the MMR vaccine. If the MMR vaccine is offered within 72 hours of exposure, it offers protection against um, measles virus infection. The measles virus has an incubation period of 8 to 12 days, and so that, so that 72 hour window is, is very useful. If somebody um, is not immune, then again, the vaccination would be offered to them. Um, there are some contraindications to the vaccine. Uh, those tend to include if you're immunocompromised, if you have any kind of febrile illness that, you know, might um, not lead to a good immune response, uh, pregnant women, uh, children under the age of one, and then also those allergic to neomycin. 
Um, the immunocompromised status, though, does not include persons on corticosteroids. So typically the, immune the immunocompromised um, issue is more for people with various types of cancer or um, other diseases, but not just due to uh, medicine. So this vaccine would be offered. Uh, they also have an immunoglobulin that would be offered. The immunoglobulin, though, is not going to prevent the infection completely. It's just going to lessen the symptoms. Um, and so depending, you know, the healthcare providers would guide on vaccination or immunoglobulin treatment post-exposure. Uh, the most important thing also, though, too, is to monitor for symptoms. So anybody who is exposed to a measles case would have to monitor for symptoms. And many times the health department will have to document these symptom diaries, as they are usually called, um, just to ensure that people are not um, coming down with any fevers, flu-like symptoms, or any of the other symptoms of measles virus infection. And these diaries would be completed for the full incubation period, typically probably two weeks post-exposure, just to ensure that the person is free and clear. And so with that, um, here's a list of some um, resources available. The CDC has some really great um, resources. They have um, information on travel to countries that may have more cases of measles um, virus infection um, that apply to all ages and talks about the vaccination schedule and a little bit about the virus and other um, resources available. And so with that, I will take any questions. Um, if you have any questions, if you would use the chat box. Um, and again, don't forget to complete the evaluation that will be um, emailed to you. So there's one question so far um, in terms of if there's any requirements for workers to be vaccinated. Um, I don't believe, um, I mean, it would also depend on your workplace. I don't believe there is a requirement to be vaccinated. Um, again, that would be something that you'd have to talk with the person who does occupational health for your area, because if you have a contraindication to vaccination, um, they can't require you to be vaccinated. However, it's important if you know you have um, suspected exposure to tell somebody that you're not vaccinated because the likelihood of being exposed and infected is much higher. I see a few other folks typing. Um, the next question is currently, is measles considered to be on the increase in the United States? According to the CDC, um, I would say no. Um, they still consider it to be eradicated from the United States or eliminated, I should say. Um, they do see clusters popping up and every year the numbers are pretty like similar. Um, they do feel that there is always the concern that measles could increase if vaccination rates do not stay where they are. And so there's always a push from the CDC and from healthcare providers to do proper vaccination schedules for persons to ensure herd immunity stays um, where it needs to be to prevent measles outbreaks. The next question is, how long does the vaccine protect from the disease? Um, based on all of the data, the two-dose vaccine cycle that's done when you're ch a child will protect you for the rest of your life. This virus is very stable. It does not mutate, um, and the serology does not change, or the ser and the serotype does not change. And so if you're vaccinated as a child, you should be immune as, immune as an adult. But if you ever have an exposure and you're not sure, then you can always have your um, blood drawn and checked or you can always receive another virus or another vaccination, excuse me. Um, the CDC does not find any risk to receiving the vaccination again as an adult. The next question is what type of gowns or PPE should be worn by healthcare providers? In the case, in the event of a known measles um, virus um, patient, you would want to wear um, some type of respirator. So an N95 or N100 or for persons with beards, um, or if they can't get a good fit test, they should be um, able to wear a powered air purifying respirator. But again, they would need to be trained um, on that respirator and it would need to be available. Um, and then typical other precautions like a rear closing gown and gloves um, would, would be sufficient. The next question is um, whether or not a positive titer uh, would still be from years ago would still be positive now. And my understanding is yes because your body is going to retain, your immune system has a memory. And so your memory immune system is going to remember that you were exposed to those antigens years ago 
And because it's such a stable virus um, and the vaccine is very effective, that if you were exposed again, then you should still be immune. Um, again, most of us are not exposed to measles on a frequent basis because of our herd immunity. Um, and younger folks are always being vaccinated, and so there's a very unlikely chance that those of us that are older um, would be exposed. But in the event of an exposure, um, a follow-up could be done quickly to ensure your immunity. I see a couple other questions coming in. The next question was just confirming the incubation period. Um, and yes, I said the incubation period is eight to 12 days after exposure. And so um, the incubation period is eight to 12 days, but somebody can be transmitting infection um, four days before they, they get the rash and four days after they, they have the rash. The next question is, what advice do you have to inform the positives of vaccination nation against the anti-vax? Um, so, you know, as a microbiologist, um, I'm always pro-vaccination. Um, I think the, I think the general public needs to have better communication in terms of the risks of the disease and how contagious this virus is. A lot of times, people in the anti-vaccination um, groups do not really understand how diseases are transmitted. Um, or how susceptible populations, for instance, like maybe children um, with pediatric cancers, for instance, cannot be vaccinated. And so those children are at increased risk and also at increased risk for a more serious infection. And so I think um, there needs to be better work um, on communicating the seriousness of the disease and also the overall safety of these um, vaccinations. I think people are scared because there were there were data um, years ago that suggested autism, but really those data have all been retracted. But the people speaking louder are the people who are against the vaccination, I, I feel. Um, and so those of us that are pro-vaccination need to um, start explaining um, the pros of, of protecting our families and ourselves against um, infectious diseases that are highly preventable. And I think a lot of people don't realize that measles is so stable that um, it's not going to mutate often, so you don't have to get a lot of booster shots and that your immunity is, is long-lasting. The next question is, how long can the virus remain on a contaminated surface? This virus is, is really short-lasting, so the longest that it can remain on a contaminated surface and, and be infectious and so cause somebody else to maybe become infected would be two hours. Uh, sometimes it will dry out even sooner than that. It's a pretty um, easily killed virus. So with that, I don't think I have any other questions. And so thank you. Uh, oh, one more question. So um, are maintenance workers in healthcare facilities at risk, the workers who clean rooms during and after patients leave? Um, so the answer to this in general, um, those, those groups of people are always at risk working in healthcare facilities to all of the different things that might be present in a healthcare facility. So this is a really good question and something that um, different agencies need to work with their maintenance staff on coming up with protocols about room cleaning after a, a highly contagious person leaves that area. So, you know, we talked in the last webinar about Ebola and the other hemorrhagic fever viruses, and so those lessons from that planning can also be used for things like measles. And so many clinical areas in the event of a measles patient, they're going to limit the number of people who can enter that, loca that location. And so if there was somebody who um, had measles infection and they were in an isolation room, more than likely they're going to bring in people to clean that room who can be properly protected. If the maintenance workers are not able to wear respirators or have PPE, then um, they may not be asked to clean that room. But it's really important that um, the maintenance workers and the clinical staff work together to create proper plans to ensure protection in terms of cleaning rooms and preparing them for the next person. Is the virus inactive once dried like the rabies viruses? 
uh, yes, so this virus, if it dries out because of the envelope, it's not going to be able to be um, infected, infectious. So after two hours, even and the next question is whether or not it's in the air. Um, it doesn't necessarily remain in the air for two hours. Um, it could travel further distances and then drop, um, but it's not going to stay in the air for two hours. It is going to settle down in about 30 minutes or so, um, like most aerosols would. But once it's dried out, it is no longer infectious. And then in terms of medical waste, the next question is medical waste treated during a measles event. Um, any sharps would be put into a sharps container. Um, most of the time, the sharps and medical waste from um, sites are incinerated or they're taken for um, a proper disposal. Uh, sometimes certain locations may have an autoclave available to them, but most of the time from clinical sites, the medical waste is going to be put into a box and, and taken away for incineration. The next question is, could I still get measles if I'm fully vaccinated? Most likely not. The data show that three out of 100 people may get measles virus infection after they're vaccinated, but if your blood was drawn and they looked for immunity, the risk would be shown there. And so if you are working in a high-risk setting, you can always ask your healthcare provider to do a titer um, on your blood to determine that you have immunity for measles. But most likely, no. I have another question coming. What advice for pre-hospital personnel for transporting patients? That's a great question. Um, and I'm sorry, I should have covered it. So, you know, I think that if, if I was an EMT or a medic and I was transporting a patient who was coughing and sneezing, um, I would put on an N95. So EMTs and, and paramedics I know are um, fit tested and trained annually. I know that they um, have the respirators available to them on um, on their trucks, and I think that often they, you, you so often see patients who have upper respiratory illness, um, and if it was me, I would put on a respirator. Um, a lot of illnesses are transmitted through the respiratory route, especially again during um, like flu season, and if you're not sure, a respirator is, is going to help you. Again, though, if you um, are not clean shaven and a 95 is not going to do anything, um, so then that would not be helpful. But also putting a surgical mask on that patient um, and just explaining that you're trying to prevent droplet exposure would be very helpful um, because the droplets can spread um, quite a distance if somebody's coughing and sneezing. And so putting a surgical mask on them is going to help prevent the droplet spread. So doing both is going to be very good. Um, and then in terms of cleaning the the, the truck afterwards, probably just wiping it down with a, with a good disinfectant, um, which is probably done for most potentially infectious patients, um, should be sufficient. The next question is whether or not there are ethnic and demographic stats with measles. Um, you know, I didn't actually look into that, um, and the CDC doesn't have that widely available on their website. I think. Um, the statistics really show that measles is more likely to occur in people who are not vaccinating. Um, typically, you know, this could be a wide range of ethnic and demographical backgrounds. Um, it could be people from maybe other countries, people um, who are now here in the United States. Um, but I'm sorry, I didn't really look into that very deeply. All right. So thank you all so much for attending. Don't forget to complete the evaluation and um, have a great day.